The Goldenrod Foundation is pleased to present the third talk in its series, Making Waves in Coastal Conservation. The series features up-and-coming experts working with new technologies, innovative ideas, and fresh perspectives in southeastern Massachusetts. Our speaker is Nate Cristofori, who holds a new position for the town of Plymouth, that of Natural Resources Warden. His talk is entitled, Words from a Warden, Balancing Law Enforcement and Conservation. But th thank you everyone for coming. This is a pretty cool experience. Um, like Dory said, I'm the Natural Resources Warden for the town of Plymouth. It's a new position that started in August. Um, we're, the department's relatively new too, so if you haven't heard the name, it's not to be unexpected. Um, this department encompasses the Department of Natural Resources, Harbor Master, and Animal Control. So that was sort of a new, uh, kind of all-encompassing um, department headed by David Gould, who has done a lot of work. You've probably heard that name kicking around the town. He's done a lot. So, um, so just, yeah, a little bit about me, um, a little background before we get going. My education, I went to Westfield State College, graduated in 2007 with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and geography and regional planning. Um, that's kind of a weird combination, but I might get into that. But I concentrate in environmental planning, which is sort of uh, a discipline of regional planning that looks at sustainability and um, open space planning, green development, and so on. And then uh, I graduated right when the market crashed. I couldn't find a job. So I went back to school, got a third bachelor's degree in environmental science from Westfield as well. Um, that brought me to 2009, and then again, the market wasn't doing so well. So I worked a bunch of different jobs. Um, finally, in 2012, I got a job down in Cape Cod uh, in Yarmouth working for a consulting company as an environmental scientist. Um, I did work down there for a couple of years with them. Um, we did a lot of consulting. I did a lot of ecological evaluations, um, permitting, and so on, stuff, stuff and the like. Um, as far as the, the training goes for that, while I was down at uh, the company down there, I got my WPIT, which is Wetland Professional in Training. It's essentially the same thing as an EIT for engineers, except in wetland science. So I got that. Um, again, then um, I got hired here. Um, prior to working here, while I was working down the Cape, kind of a mishmash thing, I worked out at Long Beach um, for 10 years. I started when I was a freshman in college as an assistant. I was an assistant for a couple of years, then I was a tech for a couple of years where I worked directly with the birds, then I was a natural resource officer for seven years, and then I got a full-time job, so I kind of like kept my way in the system and sort of clawed my way up. And um, then, yep, so I got this one in August. Started out, uh, I went through the police academy, graduated police academy in February. Um, right now I'm in the animal control officer academy, so I'm gonna try and get that certification done so we can help out with wildlife control, wildlife handling. Um, I got my boating certificate a couple months ago. I had, um, yeah, I have everything. I took an ATV course. I got my ATV certificate. That's it. Yeah, I, I might as well just keep going. And then uh, the last thing we're going to do is next year I have a, a two-week shellfish course that I'll be taking to be uh, certified in that as well. So um, anyways, what do I do? So Natural Resources Warden is kind of a funny little term. It was sort of a mishmash between natural resource officer and game warden. So if you, you might hear a couple different things thrown around, natural resources warden, game warden, conservation officer, natural resources officer. Um, you know, it's sort of like environmental police, except local. A little less police, a little more science. So what I have to do under the law enforcement side is enforce all the state and local environmental laws. So that, that can include hunting, fishing regulations, ATV regulations. Um, then I'll do natural resources protection. Um, again, shellfish and herring, you know, making sure no one's poaching out of the, the fish ladders that we have in town. Uh, the same thing goes with the glass eels. When they run, that's been kind of in the news every now and then up in Maine. They have a fishery, we don't. People take them from here, bring them to Maine, sell them. It's kind of like organized crime. Um, it's almost like the drug trade, the way it's actually been working out. It's really organized, it's really big, and it's really underground. So. Um, you know, we'll protect those. The shellfish, same thing. Go out, make sure people are shellfishing within the means, the right way, right time of year, right temperature, and so on. Um, and then we sort of get into the conservation side of things. Um, in my jurisdiction in the town is essentially the conservation areas in town. So, you know, we have the Eel River Preserve. I can enforce here, but I can't enforce anything until we get down to Beaver Dam. So it's like just pockets in town. That, that's where the law enforcement stuff happens. Um, when we do the conservation stuff, I'll basically go out and do everything that has to do with keeping those conservation areas clean, safe. 
Um, you know, last week I was out for three days just running a chainsaw all day, just cutting down trees that fall. It was a rough winter, so a lot of trails are blocked. So I might be doing that sometime. I'm still dressed like this, but I have a helmet on and the whole thing. And then, uh, so I might do that. And then on the other side of things, I'll be in the office and I'll write up a management plan, entire management plan. You know, they can be 30 pages long, but basically governs everything that can go on in that um, conservation area. And then the third thing we're going to be doing is animal control. So assuming I complete the animal control course, which I <laughs> like to imagine I would, um, that'll be in June. June 4th, we'll be done with that. Um, we're, I'm basically doing that to assist the animal control officers in town. We only have two full-time animal control officers. Plymouth is massive. They're always out on calls. So we figure that if I'm out in the field and something happens and I'm close by, well, why don't we just call me and I'll do it. They don't have to come up from exit two. It's just sort of a way to kind of streamline everything that we're, we're going through right now. Okay, so why do I have this job? Well, Plymouth is gigantic, 134 square miles, including the water, all the water in town. Um, about 6,000 acres, about nine to 10 square miles, um, not including water, is conservation land open space. So I have a lot of stuff to do. I'm always out in the field, I'm always busy because there's a lot to get done. Everyone that lives in town is paying all this tax money for this conservation land. Oh, it makes no sense to just let it kind of fall and be unmanaged. So, well, if you're paying tax money for all this conservation land, you might as well have someone manage it. So it's sort of where the, the, the basis kind of came from. And then at the same time too, I guess that might be a little bit more of my opinion, but you know, as us, as people, I mean, we should probably take care of it, right? I mean, you got these awesome, nice ecosystems that we have in town. They're so diverse. You have the Pine Barrens down South Plymouth, you have Long Beach, you have, uh, you know, nice ponds out in North Plymouth. There's just, there's so many different things. Um, it's almost like our duty as like the dominant species of the planet to maybe watch over it if we could. I think that'd be kind of good. So the job, as we kind of just went over, is sort of the combination of being a police officer, being a scientist. It's sort of like a 50-50 split um, with all the herring runs in town. I'm always out doing the herring runs, so I might be doing a herring count you know, while I'm collecting data, which is like the cool scientific part that I went to school for, and I was like, yes, data. <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, you know, I might be looking for that, but then I'm also looking at the guy that's fishing across the pond, and you know, you know I'm, I'll go talk to him. But, so it's sort of like a 50-50 split, and a scientist, I guess, with like some law enforcement powers. It's kind of a, kind of a cool thing, I like it. As far as the, the job goes, what I'm, is kind of expected of me is just a just so much stuff. The Mass General Laws, Code of Massachusetts Regulations, and Town Bylaws. So that's all the law enforcement stuff. Um, you know, you go through the police academy and you learn about Chapter 266 of property crime and 265 with personal crime. And that's all well and good. It was interesting. That's not me. That's, that's, I call the police department if I need help with stuff like that. Like, I realize my limits. That's, that's not what I do. But then you get into um, Chapter 131, which is hunting. Okay, that's, that sounds a little bit better. Or chapter 90B, which is recreational vehicles when you have ATVs and snowmobiles. Yeah, that sounds good. I like that stuff. So we got that. Um, all the town bylaws, um, chapter 30, all the beach stuff, um, you know, graffiti, solid waste, just all the stuff that's, that's really focused on what can hurt the environment, what can hurt the, the wildlife out there. So at the same time, everything that's expected of a police officer is expected of me. You know, but mainly the, these things, professionalism, I should be able to talk to people professionally and treat everyone like an equal and uh, situational control, you know, I have to think on my feet. If I'm, like the other day I was driving to one of my, my uh, um, conservation sites and there was a car accident that happened in front of me. It's like, okay, well, I got to shift for a second. You need to shift over there, everything gets all settled down and all right, we're good to go. You know, you know I have to know when to call the police, no one stuff's out of my hands. I have no illusion of what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, policies and procedures, writing reports, so on, uh, realizing that reports that I write will eventually find their way to a court system and have to be able to carry myself in front of a court, you know, in a professional manner. Um, public speaking, I'm doing that now. Um, Logicus Berticus, I kind of wrote that because that's like the, the, the scientist part where, you know, I'm expected um, to be able to walk out back and say, what tree is that and what kind of animal is that and so on. So while that's ongoing, we'll probably never, ever, 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 ever end. It's still something that is expected of me. I should, you know, spend a couple of years as a wetland scientist. I should know my wetland plants. Um, and then finally, animal behavior and control. That's sort of the animal control aspect. Um, you know, we're going through, if there's an angry dog, like, well, let's figure out why he's angry. What's he going to do next? Um, so just sort of stuff like that. All right, um, 
so I guess this is kind of the, the meat of it as to what we were going to get into today about the law enforcement. You know, it's more than arrests and fines. It's, it's pretty easy to go out there and it's like, oh, well, you did something wrong, like $50 or, you know, however that is. But I kind of wanted to see, you know, what can we do before it gets to that point? You know, it's so much, uh, so much of it is, is bred from, uh, I, for lack of a better word, from ignorance. There's, there's people, they just don't know. Um, so educational outreach was one of the biggest things that I kind of wanted to preach, um, you know, when I had my job interview. I was like, no, what we should do is get in the schools. So I've been um, working with uh, PCIS right now to get up there. Um, I think in the end of June, I'll be up there doing an ATV safety course. So everyone in the school, will come through in, in sections and, you know, just go through, you know, how to be safe on an ATV. This, you know, we've had a couple of deaths over the past decade that have been with kids. And, you know, I know a couple of the kids that are up in PCIS right now are, are friends with someone that passed away a couple of years ago. So they, you know, it hits home. But if we can at least kind of get, get it to them that, you know, well, if we learn, the more we learn about it, like the safer we can be, whether it's on ATVs, whether it's just out walking in the woods and kind of that leave no trace um, sort of mantra, but you have to, someone has to, someone has to tell them. They can't just, you know, we all know that that's how it has to go, but, you know, someone taught us that, someone told us that. Um, presence. I wanted, I, I didn't want this position to be one that was just, dr I just drove around in a truck and you're like, oh, I think that's like that new guy that works for the town, but I don't know who he is. So, you know, I wanted to come out and do things like this and, and go to schools and I want to be out in the field. I want to be walking in the field. I don't want to just drive and kind of look through binoculars and be like, yeah, it looks fine. So, you know, most of my day I'm on foot. I'm walking, you know, deep in the forest in South Plymouth. I might be 20 minutes away from my truck, but I'm just walking, you know, it helps me get to, to know the lay of the land a little bit better and some of the conservation parcels that are uh, a little less well known. Um, so it gives me a good lay of the land. Um, should anything arise, any situations arise in those pieces of property, I'll know, boom, this is how to get there. Um, Interdepartmental cooperation is going to be huge. It is huge, but we're, we're looking at it even more. At the local level, our Harbor Master Department. Our Harbor Master Department is extremely young. The oldest, you know, we have um, one of the Harbor Masters that's been there for, for years and years, but the other three guys are, I think, 33 is the oldest guy. You know, so that's awesome. We have guys that are passionate about it and they're going to stick with it for a while. So, you know, we're going to be working together local. Um, with conservation. We've been doing a lot of work with the conservation department, get, you know, getting a handle on things. And you get to the state level with environmental police. Um, the town of Plymouth just got a new officer relatively recently, um, and I've been in contact with him several times. We already have some ideas about, you know, going out and working together. And then federal, when you get up to, like, DMF and DEP, just, it, there can't be, uh, there can't be any disconnects between uh, departments when you're looking with something as broad and big as conservation and protection. Um, and then improve public perception, kind of just the same thing. I just want to make sure that, you know, people, when they do see me, they don't look at me as someone that's going to get them in trouble. They, that they can kind of come to me with, with concerns about, you know, there's a, you know, a barrel out of the, you know, out of eel. And it looks like it's in the river. It's like, okay, cool. Like, I'll go get it. You know, we'll go look at it. So. Um, I didn't want, I, the, the whole position, I just didn't want to be like uh, separated from the public. I wanted to be out in the, like, in the forefront. People know me. People see me. I, I just, that was the, the big thing for me. Um, all right, you know, just current problems that are going on, not only in the town, but, you know, statewide. Uh, recreational vehicles, you always hear about those, you know, tearing up conservation parcels, doesn't matter where it is. Poaching, um, you know, taking of any animal out of season. We have American eels, um, elvers or glass eels, you might hear them called, and the herring that run up through our herring runs every single year. And every single year you hear about someone somewhere getting pinched for it, um, especially with the glass eels. Glass eels were really big last year. Um, what they were doing with those is they'll take them, they'll, like I said, they'll go up to Maine, they'll sell them. They were going for $2,300 a pound. They're, they're, about, they're about three inches long. Yeah, it's... What do they use? Do they send... Well, what they do is they'll, they'll take them um, and they send them overseas and what they'll do is they'll rear them overseas, get them bigger, now they get a big eel and then they'll use those for food. Well, they, they, run up, they run up pretty much any outlet along the coast. Yeah, essentially like, like the herring. Um, they're, they're about three inches long, they're, they're called glass eels because they're 
pretty much transparent. Yeah. yeah, and um, it's it's pretty organized, and you know they have it together. Um, it they're easy to take. You know, you dip a, a special net in, you leave for an hour, you come back, the net's loaded, and they're gone. So, um, environmental police has been working really tough on these guys. Um, up yeah, they do all sorts. They do all sorts of that. You know, I mean, next week or in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting night patrols um, along the the fish ladders. To you know, we'll be on foot, but you know, that's the way you get them because unfortunately they'll only be out there for an hour or two and mm -hmm. you drive by and go check the next one and you come back and they're gone. So we're going to be starting doing that. Same thing with herring. Um, I know the herring poaching is, has, has calmed down a little bit. Massachusetts has the moratorium on any possession of herring. herring. So, you know, the guy that I saw, Jenny, that was casting the, the pole in, it's like if he catches that herring, that's illegal. You know, it's, I know he's going to catch it and take it and put it back, but you cannot possess a herring at any time. Hunting, fishing, and trapping. Um, I'm all for those, like, you know, go do it, go use the natural resources in, in the town, that's awesome. Um, you know, I, I know it's kind of a touchy issue with hunting because you see Bambi running through the woods and you're like, oh, but it's Bambi, but a lot of times you have to thin the herd to help the herd. You know, some, like Martha's Vineyard has had problems for years because they've had so many deer. Um, you get disease and, and uh, environmental police and DEP were taking hunting parties out to Martha's Vineyard to thin the herd because it was so bad. So, you know, hunting, while it's not some people's thing, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to do. Um, it's, it's recreational, it's nice, get outside, use the land. Um, so it's not so much a problem, but it's a matter of doing it correctly. You know, have your permits in place, wear your safety gear, make sure you're using the right weapons, and so on, so. Okay, I thought this was funny. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of true, I don't want to say I've met people like that, <laughs> but you've met people like that, and uh, the, the host of things that is wrong with this picture is, is exactly what I'm trying to kind of fix. Never mind the firearm and the no helmet, and uh, it's like a headache to look at, but um, this is, yes, yeah, that's Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> But yes, it is also do not resuscitate. Um, that's right. So, so this is the issue that we're trying to we're trying to work on. But I thought that was funny. Okay. So I mentioned educational outreach. Like, well, what does that mean? What are we trying to do? Well, like I said, I went to PCIS, talked to the a couple of the people up there. I talked to the vice principal. I talked to the science teacher. I talked to the school resource officer. I talked to gym teachers. I talked to a bunch of people. Um, oh yeah, also when I couldn't find a job, I was a substitute teacher in Plymouth, so, <laughs> so that helped. Um, so I knew them from that, but I went up there and we're saying, you know, it'd be kind of nice, like, let's do start doing this yearly ATV safety thing. I know a lot of people up there ride, uh, which is great, like, riding's nice, but there's a lot of stuff that we have to do right. There's so many places you can't ride in Massachusetts. Well, we need to figure out a way to let people know you can't ride in the power lines, you can't ride in the conservation lands. There's only several, there's only a handful of places in Massachusetts you can ride. It's just the way the state works. Up in New Hampshire, yeah, you can go on the power lines all the way to Canada, and it's a lot of fun. I've done it. But in Massachusetts, it's very strict. Um, but, I mean, this 10 year old kid doesn't know that. You know, um, we have. Uh, or the environmental police has handbooks that we're going to be bringing and we're going to give them out to all the kids. Um, we're looking to have all the kids go through the course. Um, not even the course, the presentation. The course is like too official, but the presentation just because um, while he doesn't have an ATV, I'm sure his buddy does. I'm sure he's gone over to his buddy's house to ride it. So as long as everyone can know that, you know, we can't stop kids from physically riding on the power lines or riding where they're not supposed to, but we can educate them enough to know why they shouldn't do it. And then the big thing that we're trying to do is just safety. It's wear your helmet, wear your pants. You know, it's silly to say, but wear long pants, boots, gloves, and the whole thing. So we're going we're gonna to go through that. We're going to be working with the environmental police. We're trying to get maybe a representative from a local power sports store to maybe go up. Um, but you know that's ongoing. But at some point that will be going, that will be happening. We're going to be uh, trying to make our way into all the schools. Uh, logistically, it's a little tough because there's one of me and there's what nine elementary schools, two middle schools, two high schools. So it's a lot of places to go. But but we're going to get there. Um, outdoor classroom again with PCIS. PCIS is a really unique school because it backs up to a giant conservation land and it's beautiful. You go back to the conservation land, a 10-minute walk, and you're at 
Cook's Pond, I believe it's Cook's Pond. Confronted. And uh, well, there's a lot of cool stuff in that pond. And um, even if it's just like, let's just look, like, what do you find? You know, we can do a lot of stuff and we're going to be, you know, trying to get them down there. We want to get field trips out to the herring run when the herrings run. And it'll be nice, I can give them all counters and they can data collect for me. And then it's like, yes, like, look at all this. This is great. Um, but just to be able to see that and see, you know, um, let's, like, let's see this, this cool migration process in, in person. And um, the science teachers said that they'll create like a curriculum leading up to it where, you know, they'll do like a, a mammalogy day and an ichthyology day. And it's like on the fish day, like we're going to talk about fish and then we're going to go out and actually look at them. And, um, you know, the department has, the, my department has permission from the state that I can, you know, I can take some out of the water and we can show them to the kids and I can handle them, and, which is cool. So it's strictly for that. It's for educational purposes. So like, outstanding. Let's do that. Um, like, so like I said, uh, field trips, the herring run, the conservation areas, um, the Center Hill conservation area, uh, the western side where it, it, it abuts the beach, tidal pools, like in the summertime or, you know, in the spring, early fall, um, there's so much stuff just like to look at. So but that's why I want to get like the hands on it. You know, it's some kids, you know, in the, in the classroom, it reaches them, you know, looking through books and it makes sense. And like, yeah, that was one of those kids and it was fine. But to get out there and get dirty and, and you know, see the science, it, it really makes it a little bit better. So um, I also want to get involved in this, the science and geography fairs. When I was in PCIS, I won the science fair. So I would love to go back, you know, uh, I was that kid. And, um, you know, even if it was to just to walk around off the clock, it's fine. Talk with the kids or if they want me to help judge, you know, I'm more than happy to do that stuff. But that's part of the presence thing. That's where I want the kids to see me and not look at me as someone to be afraid of, but look at someone like, oh, he knows the science stuff and he's out in the woods. And, um, you know, like maybe that's a job that I can someday, you know, try and get. So I've already had a couple of kids call me about it, being interested in the position. And like, I've only been here for like six months. You already want my job? So... Well, you know, that, but that's awesome. That's like the kind of response that I'm looking to get. You know, I love talking to the kids. So, so that, you know, that's, that's where we're heading. Um, so, you know, why am I trying to do this outreach stuff? Um, the middle school and the elementary school kids are like the perfect age to, to just absorb everything. Um, and I'm sure you've all, all noticed that. And unfortunately, they absorb the bad stuff and the good stuff. And they can't really decipher yet. And so they're going to pick whatever they keep hearing the most. So um, out at the beach, like you hear about that a lot with the birds, like they don't, you know, adults don't like the birds and the kids hear the adults don't like the birds. And so now these little kids don't like the birds. And it's like, well, you know, I've had little kids say like, oh, those darn birds. And like, well, what don't you like about them? <coughs> like, you, you don't know what you don't like about them. Like, I realize your parents will like them and a lot of people don't like them, but like, why? So like, maybe if we can talk about this and figure out why and you realize that like, oh, well, the reason we're out there is actually to keep the beach open, not close it. You know, it might make a little bit more sense. So. If we can talk to the kids when they're that age and they're, they're willing to just hear and absorb all this information, that's, that's where it's going to start, you know, making an impact. Um, at the same time, uh, for deterrence, you know, the ATV stuff is a perfect example of deterrence. Um, you know, I can talk about ATV safety all day long. I can, you know, talk about where to go, where not to go. But the long short of it is they need to know that if they go, then I'm out there and that I'm going to see them and I'm going to find them and I'm going to say, I talked to you last week and you know. So it's a matter of them realizing like, oh, okay, well, you know, someone is out there watching now. It's, it's not just I get this free pass to go. Uh, and the face to be seen again. I'm just out there. I want them to recognize me, not be afraid to come up and talk to me. Um, okay, my presence. So, yeah, well, we'll just go through it quick. So, um, you know, I just want to be out there on all the conservation uh, properties, the popular parks, Morton, Nelson, Hedges, Fresh Pond, these popular summer kind of summer destination spots. Out at Long Beach, I have plenty of experience out at Long Beach. Um, I told Tori before we started, I'm probably not going to be out there too, too much this year, but I'll be out there in the busy days. Fourth of July, I'll be out there, Memorial Day, Labor Day, uh, probably some Saturdays when it gets pretty busy. Um, Browns Bank, well, I'm not going to be standing on Browns Bank. We're working with Harbor Master. You know, and we'll be, we'll be going around. We're going to be making patrols out there. And then major, major town events, um, you know, the Herring Run celebrations, which are having, you know, that's coming up. Yeah. Yep. So it's coming up this weekend. Uh, Friday, they're doing the, the uh, dam dedication out of, up on Billington, Billington Street. Whether or not I'll be there at that, because we're putting in the floats down in the harbor, too. But in any event, um, town events like that, like the Run for Conservation that they have out in, in the State Forest. Um, you know, I ran that a couple of times. And the 4th of July parade, I'll be, probably be down at a... Uh, 
uh, Town Brook and, and Brewster. But it, and not so much to, to watch, well, not to watch the parade, obviously, but to kind of keep an eye on the people, but also be like, oh, like, like who's that? You know, and just so, you know, the, the big town events is where there's the most people and I'm going to be the most visible. And then um, hunting and fishing hotspots. There's a couple around town just to do hunting and fishing license checks. Um, same thing. No, now they have to realize, okay, EPOs are going to be out there too, but now this is jerk from the town is going to be out there too. So, <laughs> um, so the, the, effects, the effects of presence, <laughs> that, like I just said, I, I just want people just need to know that they're now being watched. Um, you know, I have, I have the background, I have the education, I have the training, um, I know what I'm doing. It may not seem like it all the time, but I do. Um, and it'll act, you know, it'll act as a deterrent for those people that are going to poach, that are going to ride when they're not supposed to ride. At the same time, on the flip side, it's going to, hopefully, my presence out in these conservation areas are going to make people feel safe. I know we've gotten calls before where there's people that want to walk these pieces of conservation land they don't know too well, and, you know, they don't feel safe doing so. It's like, okay, well, you know, I did a patrol through there this morning. You know, I can't be there, I can't be everywhere where I can be, but I can tell you that, you know, there's no... Um, like homeless camp up there, you know. I know that that's been an issue in the past, and it's an issue everywhere. It's not just located to Plymouth, but um, just issues that make people feel unsafe and know that, you know, I'm out there. I, I hope that helps. Um, compliance, same thing. Um, make sure the people that are using it are using it the way they're supposed to be. Uh, bang for your buck, same thing. You're paying for me. You might as well be outside doing something, right? Um, and then intelligence, too. I can gather... Um, all the data that you know that I can find from all these different pieces of conservation land, see, no, see what needs to be done, see what you know hasn't been done yet, and so on. Um, and that goes the same thing as the herring runs and all that. So there's intelligence I can data for law enforcement, I can gather stuff for conservation. Um, just some interdepartmental interdepartment, cooperation that we've been going with. Police Department, Hard Master, Animal Control, right off the bat, the huge ones for the local. They've all been great. We work together all the time. It's, you know, it's a fantastic kind of uh, like brotherhood that we have. Um, and then state with environmental police, DEP, DFW, DMF, um, just different departments that we all work together with different things. You know, EPOs are going to help me with the law enforcement stuff. Um, DFW helps with the, the herring run. So um, like I had said before, if you want to contact everybody and be in talks, um, this is the cooperation that happens. Um, nothing, you just can't do anything alone anymore. The town's too big. There's too many issues that happen in here. You have to call for help. You know, if I don't know a question, if I don't know the answer to a question, you know, I call up the EPO. You know, he can give me that answer. So, thanks. Um, so the public, that's me, doing <laughs> doing scientific stuff. So I'm installing a transducer in Town Brook. Kind of gives us some um, water temperature information. Um, so I want the, the the public perception. You know, it needs to be a scientific shift. Um, you know, you can look at me as, you know, being in uniform and thinking, oh, well, he's going to be trouble. It's like, well, yeah, but 50% of my job is also doing scientific stuff. So you need to know that, you know, I'm, I'm not just out there to arrest you. Like a lot of times I have other, other stuff that needs to be done. Um, I went over before, more than arrests, more than tickets, education, presence, and so on. Um, property management, you know, same thing. People look out there and see, like, why is Nate carrying a chainsaw today? It's like, well, you know, it needs to be done. And... I might as well do it. So, and approachability, same thing. Uh, as I've said before, I just kind of want to like, you know, new position, just trying to like get it out there. Um, just someone to talk to, someone that knows the stuff, um, known to be afraid of. Okay, so what can you guys do um, as far as helping us out? Biggest thing is report. Report just whatever. If it bothers you about something out in the conservation land, call us up and let us know. Um, yeah, I'll have it. I have a list of important numbers at the end. Um, so, you know, report, report, report. Um, participate in adv advocacy groups, you know, SEMPA, uh, TNC, Trustees of Reservation, Wildlands Trust, all these adv advocacy groups have, you know, the same common goal. Um, you know, we work with all those, all those groups. They, they're all landholders. Our land abuts their land, and our trails go into theirs, and theirs come into ours. And, but we all have that same goal of preserving the space and, and using the space. That's the other thing. It's, yeah, it's nice to have this big green area, but, you, you know, we should be able to use it. You know, whether it's for hunting or fishing or walking, whatever it is, you know, it can be used. Um, you can help by leaving no trace. You know, don't litter. It's pretty easy. Take pictures, you know. 
leaf footprints, that's it. And use the properties. You know, we have all these cool resources, you know, that you, you're paying for, or the town's paying for. You know, go out and use them. It's, it's awesome when I'm out there and I, you know, I get to see somebody that's, you know, sitting on the side of a pond just sitting there. It's like, that's great. Like, that's use. Passive recreation. I love it. You know, that's, that's awesome. Long Beach, you know, it's a completely different entity, but, you know, so many people use it and it's there. Um, and people are getting better about it, but you know, you still have, you still have issues, but you're always going to have issues with everywhere. So, um, just, yeah, get out and use them and, and, you know, feel fortunate for what you have, you know, just in our backyard. Those are our important numbers you can have. Uh, my department, 1620 extension 127, that'll get you, um, our administrator. I'm out in the field all the time. So if you have something that is field related, she can relay it to me. Um, Harbor master, animal control. Uh, environmental police, that's their violation line, so that's specifically for violations, if you see anything. Um, I'm pretty sure they're dispatched 24 hours a day, too. Um, DEP's violations for spills and dumping. Cape Wildlife Center, Injured Wildlife. It's a wicked, wicked cool facility they have down there. I went down and took a class. They take pretty much anything but deer right now. Um, inj injured Wildlife, they take... Every now and then they'll send something out saying... Uh, that you know they can't take any more of something because they run out of space but really really good uh, very talented wildlife veterinarians that work there they're just, that are staffed um, and then the New England Aquarium um, obviously for your marine life and, and um, fish and, and so on obviously yeah Cape Wildlife Center doesn't take any mar marine mammals but I can give you the numbers for that. it's probably off the top <laughs> of your head right, right so so does anyone have any questions? I'll do what I can. Like I said, I started in August, so I don't... I've got two. Okay. Question one is, um, with the ATVs yes. and the power lines, Yes. why is it illegal? Is it the power companies that don't yeah. them up? Okay. Yep, it's private. Yep. So, so it's NSTAR. Of, instead of NSTAR saying, hey, you know what, we're going to pay some people to monitor the power lines mm -hmm. and maybe charge some tolls so people can use it. Right. You know, they basically... They just don't. Okay. Yeah, they just don't. Um, the there's a ton. Yeah, there's a ton of liability. And uh, a lot of those power lines run through conservation areas, so I'm more than happy for them to tell them no. But, yeah, the big thing is it's private. Yeah, the same with the gas lines. Now, on the depth, on the, uh, primarily the dumping, um, yep. do they cover the whole state? We were over in Taunton. They should. Behind an elementary school, and there was all kinds of trash out there. Yeah, they should. They should. Um, We've called, I've called DEP for, you can call them for, for different things, but I know spills and dumping is that number is the big thing for them. Yeah, so. Let me interrupt for just a oh. sec. Uh, I will um, write down all these numbers and I'll email them to all of you since you signed up. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you'll get all the phone numbers. Well, first of all, it's good to see, I've seen you all many summers working out. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you coming up. And see me grow up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 No more responsibility, except I'm not chainsaws in the heat. I don't know. <laughs> Glad to see it happening. Somebody's worked hard He's for got it. The, the EPs have his back. They did a phenomenal <laughs> job last week at the bike race in Miles Standish. Good. We had 10 transports go out. Good. And if it wasn't for the EPs and the Stadies, Brewster would have been screwed. Sure. Yeah, I think Bob might so have had a question. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, been out at the beach 28, 29 years. Sure. And, you know, could always throw a rod in. Mm -hmm. Fish. Mm -hmm. Now we're supposed to have a license. I probably have to get and get the fishing rods out. But what happens when you have company? You get somebody from out of state. You're out there catching. You say, "Hey, you want to?" You know, there's no such thing as a guest license. Right. There's should, not. There should be something. Um, they're, if they're out of state, I'll ch I'll check. I think I remember reading something in in the uh, the fisheries and wildlife brochure. They put out one every year, and I think there actually might be a guest license fee now. Okay. Um, you have a house license. There, yeah, there could there could be something like that. Um, yeah, I don't have it with me, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and get that. I'll try and get that for you, because okay. um, I don't I'll know that off the top of my head. Yeah. The next um, plants. Mm -hmm. I've heard something about at Long Beach, and obviously most of my questions be at Long Beach, that there might be removal of um, invasive species of plants and not natural. Is what's going on with that, or is that true? Or um. That's probably a better question for Karen. I know um, in the maintenance plan for the beach, it does address invasive removal. So I know, um, like we've been out there taking like Oriental bitter bittersweet out, you know, because that's a uh, hellacious invasive. Um, I'm not sure how it works with replanting things. 
I know that there's been issues in the past with planting um, salt spray rose, Japanese rose, because it's a, yeah, rose rugosa. Seems to hold things together, yeah, but it's a potential invasive now. Yeah, so they're, they're, it's, it's not an official invasive. They're still undergoing all that data collection. For, yeah, it's just it's not from here. You know, it's, it, it, regardless of how long an invasive has been here, if it's not here, it's an invasive. So I'm not too sure about um, how planting goes, but um, the inv I know the invasive removal is covered under that, that beach maintenance plan. Is that being done now? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I have to make a report. Okay. I was down at uh, Town Hall at a meeting just now, went around the corner to the Yacht Club, and a coyote walked around. <gasps> oh, sure. Yeah. That's yep. Yeah, that's known. Yeah, yeah that's known. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a den behind the fire station at Stevens Field. Yep. Yeah, actually, yep. Yeah, I've seen it walking down my street as well. Yep, yeah, it that's, comes up by the light shop. Yep, that's known. Yeah. Well, is that... Um, no, no, you don't have to worry. Well, okay, I'll get. <laughs> I'll give you the coyote, the coyote uh, speech. <laughs> so um, they have every right to be where they are. Um, if you're worried about, like, you have pets, you're worried about them. Just bring them inside. You know, keep them inside. Don't feed your pets outside. Cover your trash. Keep your trash away from your house. Um, you know, they're they're pretty good at foraging. You might see them. They're s they're super afraid of you though. Yeah. That you will never ever have a problem with a single coyote with two coyotes. Um, what we tell a lot of people that live in the, the, the more rural parts of town, um, where there's more coyotes, if you're afraid of them, go out in your backyard and make noise. Like bang pots together, they'll, they'll take off. Yeah, they're, they're um, you know, if, if uh, you know, one seems sick or a little out of whack, yeah. call animal control. Yeah, because, you know, rabies is still a real, yeah. a real thing. Rabies and coyotes is, is actually pretty rare, but it's there. Um, and then you'll see, you know, you can see coyotes with mange and they look kind of gross and, you know, if it's sick, yeah, that's something that animal control will want to take and try and rehab it and, and if they do that and it's okay, they're bringing it right back to where they got it from. So, um, you know, they're, they're fine. They're, they're pretty cool animals. Um, yeah, they're, they're big. They ate really well this winter. Um, the ones that I've seen have been big, but if they're eating well, that means they're not going to be coming after you, you know, so. They're eating little critters, but yeah. So. There are also red fox in that neighborhood now. You've seen red, red fox sure. in my backyard. Kind of yep. Yeah, they're all over the place. But anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. How do you identify an eel poacher? What do they exactly do? Mm. It's more. It's my houses or. Yeah. So um, what the eel poachers will do, they'll they'll take a net. It's called a fike net. Um, it looks sort of like a big cylindrical tube with a mesh all the way around it. It kind of gets smaller. And they'll string it across a river from bank to bank, and they'll sink it so it's underwater. They're usually black. They're really, really hard to see. And all they do is they set that net, and they leave. High tide comes up. The eels come up with the high tide. High tide goes down. They come back before the tide shows their net, pick up their net, and they're gone. So it's, it's easy, you know, almost for lack of a better phrase. It is. It's easy. Um, and it's just they just scoop them up, this big net throw them in the bucket, and they're in the, in the truck and they're going. So what they've done in the past is um, guys will drop the poacher off, go, the guy will set the net, he'll circle around, come back, pick the guy up. So you, you won't even see the truck. So that's what we're going to have to be doing on foot because most of the time someone dropped them off. But um, it's, it's more the, the poaching, identifying the poachings um, is more of what are they doing. You know, the guy walking down the street, you know, I don't know. But... You know, if he's next to an area where there's no glass eels with that material, yeah, well, we're going to have a talk. But. Have you thought of using camera traps? Uh, yeah, yep. We're, we're considering doing that for a couple things, for ATV stuff too. Um, yeah, the trap cams, um, especially down here, behind here, because the power lines run through um, the preserve. So we're, we're looking into that. We've done um, trap cams in South Plymouth for dumping. We've worked with the state with that because there's, a, there's an area in South Plymouth where it, one side of the road state, one side's town, and they're dumping on both, so working with... Uh, down, and that's talking like down by Wareham Road, yep. the dirt section? Uh, a little further, actually further down there, down by uh, White Island. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah so so um, there's a lot going on there, but uh, they work pretty well. We've gotten hits, so can't ask for more than that. You know, it's just a matter of getting license plates and being able to follow up on them, but, but that's going well, yeah. So, anybody else? Sounds like a huge job that you've got. Yeah. I'm busy, yeah. I have, I have plenty to do. 
sounds like you need four. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, the part of the battle right now is just identifying what needs to be done and then getting a hold of the resources to, to get it done. Um, the biggest thing that we have on our side is a, a department that's willing to do what we need to have done and then having an EPO officer, an environmental police officer that's so close. He's, he's stationed in Plymouth and he's for Plymouth, that's it. Plymouth is so big. Um, unfortunately, they're so short staffed in the state. I think there's only 80 of them for the whole state that sometimes he'll be in Abington, he'll be in Dartmouth and he'll be down the Cape helping. But um, is that, is that officer Je still? it's Jack Chapin. Jack Kelly's Chapin. Gone. Um, I don't know. I don't know where, where he went. I forget who the, the guy that was here before. But, um, you know, we'll be, when we start doing the, the poaching patrols, and we're going to be working really closely with him. Um, and he's, he's very approachable. So um, if you ever get a chance to, to meet him or you hear him talk, he'll probably give you his cell phone number. He's, he's been outstanding. You, you can't really ask so much more than that. When we did the boating class, um, a couple months ago, he came down. He, you know, helped with the boating class, and um, he's going to help when I go to PCIS for the ATV course. And so he's he's very much um, out there. He wants he's kind of the way I'm looking at my position. He wants to be, you know, approachable, and you know, he, the, the law enforcement stuff that they do is is well beyond what I can do. Um, you know, their arresting powers are, are far exceed anything that I'll ever be able to do. But they're they're environmental police, you know. Police isn't in my title. My title is, you know, natural resources. So um, that's, but that's part of the reason why he's such a big help. You know, if I need help, I call him up. And we were, we were asking him um, prior to doing, setting up the, the Elver patrols, you know, what would you do if you caught a guy that was poaching the Elvers? He was like, well, I'll, I'll arrest him, you know? And like, but we're like, well, I mean, if we catch him, I don't think we can arrest him. But, you know, we're looking at, you know, can we confiscate their equipment? You know, we can find them. We know we can find them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we confiscate their equipment, it hits them a little bit harder, you know. But do, and do they know that you can't arrest them? I mean, you can sort of put them through the paces. And well, what we can do is we can, we can detain yeah. and we can have the police come down, you know. So if we detain and we call Jack and say, hey, Jack, you know, we have a guy. You know, come on down here. How will you detain them? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, hopefully. Now, are you armed at all? I have only what you see on me. Yep. So I, I don't have a firearm, no. Nope. You got a taser or anything? No, no sir. No, no. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, then. He's baby. got so a pretty heavy-looking flashlight. I have a baton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all I have. You know, no, no, no firearm, but... Harbor Masters carrying firearms? Yes, sir. They yes, they do. talk about taking them away, which didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I don't, but... I'll probably be using the Harbmaster a lot more because of that. I mean, hunting permit checks. Those guys tend to have weapons. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, that, it, that'll, that'll work itself out. It'll, it'll figure it out. I, you know, I, I, trust, uh, I trust Dave and, and the police chief, and I'm sure they, they know it's best. And, you know. Police presence in the past few years has been great out at the beach. Mm. You know, been more in the middle, moving around. Sure. I think it's made a difference out there. Yeah, yeah I think it has. Four wheel drive truck. Yep, now. I think it has. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> at, least, at least we have them, and, right. and, and I think they're going to keep getting a four-wheel drive truck. So I, I'm interested in the, the town politics behind your position and the, the support that you mm -hmm. get from town officials, from the community, um, you know, funding, mm -hmm. I mean, how much support, how much do you have to worry about resources and, and um, backup? Well, Dave Gould worries about that stuff for me. Um, as far as, like, if I need help, back up, that's just a phone call away. Well, I'm just yeah. sort of thinking, you know, sort of larger, like, could, if, if you uh, started doing things that made people unhappy, mm -hmm. what, what kind of support, I mean, the town, sort of, you know, the whole sort of generic thing, do you think, um, you know, the, this new position is, is pretty solid? And, and oh, I, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think... The, the, the position's been a long time coming. Um, I, I know just from working out at the beach in the past, it, it, it started about like two years ago where they were trying to get it going. Um, from what I understand, like way back they had someone that was in a similar position to mine and then for whatever reason it stopped. But um, the, 
<laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, I know the the research has been done, you know, and, and it's gone before the selectmen, it's gone before, you know, you know, all the normal channels that I had to go through to, to get to it. Um, you know, the workload's definitely there. Um, there's just, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, you know, it's, it's a great job. You know, I, I went to school, pretty much built my resume for a position like this. So not to like kind of toot my own horn, but it, it kind of helps if you're working in a position that you're passionate about. You know, I, I grew up in Plymouth, so I sort of have a vested interest in protecting the town. I live in Plymouth now, but um, just I, kn I know Plymouth pretty well. And, you know, it's kind of nice to know that I'm doing my best to protect what I can. But um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think we're on the right track anyway. You know, it's, it's going to be a little while, but you know, we'll get there. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, what the environmental police do when they catch? Or be riders riding in illegal areas? Uh, usually it's a, it's a fine. Uh, most of the fines for uh, recreational violations are expensive, like $250. And that can, that's for most things. You know, it might be $250 for trespassing. It could be $250 for not having your ATV registered, $250 for having a rider that's too small for the ATV. Um, so they balloon really quick. And it, hit, it hits home really quick. You know, and those violations will stand up because uh, Massachusetts is really strict on, you know, preventing riders from not being where they're supposed to be. Um, there's, a, there's a list online that you can find of the legal places to ride in the state, and there's about 20. There's not many. Mm -hmm. There's not many. It, it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's reactive. I mean, half the reason why it's like that is because it was abused. You know, it's like anything else. It's, it's you know, you have something good and then you abuse it, you give an inch, they take a mile and, you know, they take it away and it's, it's, I don't think you'll ever see it come back that you can ride to the power lines again. I don't, I don't foresee that happening, but um, the e environmental police, they're really good about setting up, um, I guess, I don't want to say stings, but like, almost like speed traps on the power lines. You know, they'll have a guy down here, they'll, the guy will take off that way and there's a guy waiting at the other end. Um, you now I'll be working with those guys this summer doing that same stuff. Um, but, you know, it is, it is what it is. You, they do all the ATV safety courses in the state. If, you, if you're, uh, you know, under 16, you want to ride an ATV, you have to take a course. And it has to be certified by the environmental police. For the most part, they do it. Um, when I got hired for this job, I had to take an ATV safety course just to ride the ATV that, you know, we have. And um, it's the same thing. They teach you from the ground up. I've been riding ATV since I was, you know, seven years old. And, you know, I know how to turn, but you know, you start from the beginning. Like this is the seat. Like these are the handlebars. And but it, it's a it's a strict course that everybody gets the same course. You know, um, the kids that want to ride that are below 16, um, they take the course, but their parent does too, and they both get the same course. Um, so that the the most you can do is like I kind of said before, you can't stop them from riding, but hopefully you can prevent anything catastrophic from happening. Just by offering some safety, some safety. So, so. I see the average dirt bike is doing well, standing state forest, but just wondering how extensive it is in South Plymouth and other areas also. It's yeah, it's it's been bad. Um, the state forest. I think the only thing you can ride up in the state forest are snowmobiles right now, um, dirt bikes and ATVs. I'm pretty sure you can't. Um, in South Plymouth, down by um, the ponds of Plymouth, that area is pretty bad. There's a lot of activity that goes through there. Um, I did a, a big a two day uh, kind of tour of the town where I checked every single um, power line and gas line crossing where it crosses the road in town. There's like 50 something of them. Checked every single one of them. And we have a lot, so I have a lot of data collected about the areas that are really busy with high traffic areas. Went on the GIS, I mapped it out um, basically with like, uh, um, like amounts per crossing and you can see corridors it's like they'll go this way you know mm. this this corridor here is empty no one uses this one but this one that leads from Wareham to Middleborough yep there's a lot there so it's just one more thing that you know the EPOs and I now know well let's go down there you know that's where they are it makes no sense to go up uh, in the one in the, the Pine Hills when there's no one riding up there so well, they're riding there. yeah they're riding there. oh I know they're, they're riding everywhere you know it's it's picked up Yep, and it's picked up 
in recent weeks. Yeah, I'm sure what you wind up doing is you're going to chase them. You know, you'll go down to yeah. Plymouth and you, they'll go to areas. And, yep. And hey, you know, they're riding up here in North Plymouth again. And, you know, they're in Kingston. And you'd be up. Yeah, you know, it's just like speeders. Like, you know, cattle, you know, the, out west, you know, how they have um, where roads and fences, they have the. Uh, I don't know what you call it, grates that prevent the, the cattle from oh, right. I mean, can you right. well, we put things on the trail? Yeah, we get a, yeah, you've probably seen like some of the gates, the yeah. big green gates. I mean, those were great. They're just expensive, right. you know. Um, there's grants that we can write that we're working on, try and get a couple more. And, I, and unfortunately, because they're hundreds of dollars and you have to have them installed and they're pretty labor intensive, they're slow to get. But when you do get them, yeah, they work awesome. Um, the issue is with dirt bikes especially, is there's so many spots they can come in. Um, you'll see, especially if you go a little bit further down here, the power line crossing right after, um, or right before Plymouth South, um, you'll see a gate, and then there's this gigantic wooden fence. It's because, yeah, there's a gate there, and then they rode around it, and then they rode around the fence, and then they rode through that guy's yard. So it just keeps expanding. Yeah, it just, it just keeps expanding. So the only thing you can do is, um, you know, try and find out when they're going to do rides. A lot of times they do group trail rides. And there's ways to figure out when they're doing those rides. So if you use camera traps mm -hmm. and you do get a picture of the license plate, is that uh, something oh, you can use in court? Yo, that helps. A lot of them don't have them. No, no the majority of people that ride don't register their vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that's half the battle right there. You know, if I see a guy that I'm like, all right, here he comes and he drives by me. And it's like, it's a yellow bike. And it's like, that's all I have. It's a yellow bike, you know. Well, can it's, you confiscate? I can't. Can uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. sure. Registered? Yeah, absolutely. Just like a car. If you don't register your car and they can tow it, same thing. Yep. Take out the places they buy them and get them repaired. Yeah. Well, they're legal to have, so we can't do that. You know, I mean, this, they're fine to have, but <laughs> well, the, you can't. I mean, you know, yeah. Well, you know, there's there's nothing there's nothing against the guys selling them. You know, you know the the power sports stores in town. It's, you know, they assume that you're gonna ride legally. <laughs> You know, it's just like anything else. They can't. That you're buying it to put it on a trailer. That's to it. To Middleborough to race or that, go up to Southwick. That's, or that's what they do. There are places. Yep. You know. So they don't have to register when they buy them. Uh, it, it's just like a car. You have to register within that certain amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, a lot of times they set up all the paperwork for you. You know, I, I bought a motorcycle and they, everything was all set up. It's just like, all right, just go to the DMV. I think there's one more question here. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Why shouldn't it be like cars that you have to get them registered? Sale. Right. Well, a, a lot of times what happens too is you register it that year. And then when the registration's up, nah, you know. Well, with cards, you, you're supposed to get them registered again. And, uh, sure. But people can take them off, I understand. It's right. Well, a lot of times, I mean. They're not always on an area where they're seen. Sure. Well, the same, the, the thing with a car is they're so out there, you know, you'll be driving down the road and that police officer can be like, hey, a car's not registered. You know, there's no sticker. The, the, the Dirt bikes that are riding in the woods, once their registration expires, there's nothing making them get that registration re-upped, you know? Most of them ride down a road before they get to the woods. Yep, a lot of them and do. they're doing that illegally. Sure, they're not even supposed to cross a road. Yeah, yeah. Right. yep. But um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a, lot of, a lot of ways around it that, you know, you and I might not think about, but it's because we're like, well, you can't do that. And they're saying, well, you know, I don't need to do that. You know, forget it. But... Yeah, this, it's, it's an uphill battle, you know. It's a battle that's been fought for decades. And, yeah. you know, it's, whether or not it's getting better, I don't know. I haven't been here long enough to tell, but um, I'm sure it's going to keep me busy. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, some neighborhoods know who the kids are. Mm -hmm. They all say, oh, it's Frank's kids. Mm -hmm. um, so why isn't that a good source? It's a great source. But nobody probably is calling you to tell you about Kids. No, no, they're not. I would love to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you see him, if you see him riding down the road, you know, his, and he's going to that house. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen, I've seen videos online of not in the town, but there's videos online where they throw the cameras on their helmet and they drive down. Awesome. I can follow him right back to his house. You know, perfect. I love it. You know, post more of those. You know, they, you'd be surprised that you can find online, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on a forum. It's important for a message to get out to the newspaper, or however messages get out nowadays, mm -hmm. people should uh, rap on their 
Evil neighbors. Maybe Sam. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know. Provide useful information. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, right, it, it, that information, you know, that doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt because, you know, the long end of it is if they're riding down their drive, the, the road that they live on to get to the piece of land that they're going to ride on, well, they just did two things wrong. You know, they rode on the road and they're riding in the conservation land, so just because I didn't see him do it right there, if we can get some evidence and I see the video and like, well, okay, let's jump on him, you know? If Joe rats out on Frank's kids, the problem always happens in neighborhoods. Frank's gonna rat out on Joe's kids. Awesome. I just got two people. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, and, and you know, should I get a phone call about, you know, someone's kid just rode down the, the driveway and I go to that house? I might just go and talk. You know, not everything has to be, I'm going to write you a ticket. It's like, no, let's just, you know, let's just go over this, you know. Like, let's go look at your bike. You know, it's like, okay, like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. It's like, let's get that fixed, you know. It's like, it's not necessarily the, the end of the world. Not, I don't want to take your bike. You know, it's a lot of paperwork if I had to take your bike. But um, let's just, like, figure it out. You know, let's, let's start moving towards the right direction. It's just, sometimes the best course of action isn't getting someone in trouble. It's, like I said before, kind of just educating them, you know. But and a follow-up. Follow up to key. You could uh, confiscate their bike. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. If it was the tenth, twelfth time you caught them and you inspected them, you could do this. Right, not me personally, but it could be done. It could be done. It could be done. Could. Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I know, I know, environmental police does it. So it sounds to me like well, the town of Plymouth could make some money <laughs> building an, o, an ORV park. It sounds to me That's like. Um, that's yeah, something, yeah. yeah. Like, they thought like about they it. They can do a whole presentation on ORV, yeah, right? <laughs> and all of you would probably come. Well, Nate, I want to thank you thank very you. much. All right. Much. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, guys.